All right, Jay Baba, everyone, and welcome to another session with Ward Parks on creation and its causes. Mm -hmm. Since we don't have the book available right now, um, we're going to have to try to muddle through it with Ward. He's going to share the screen from his PDF, and we have some readers set up. And the reason I chose these readers, just FYI, is because they have a good, I know they have a good connection and a clear reading voice and things like that. So that'll make it easier for people who watch the video to be able to follow along with this also. All right, do you want to say anything before we start, Ward? Um, yeah, um, about this. Can you see the screen? Is it showing? Yep. So this is the uh, second of the talks and uh, we could begin by looking at this figure, but I wanted to say a couple things about it. Um, one is that this talk uh, uh, is a sort of another introduction in a way. Baba is not really coming to the main topic of his series in this talk yet, but he's talking uh, again about um, coming the different kinds of knowledge of God. Remember in the first one, he talked a good bit about how uh, if you want to know God, you have to find a master and the master will bring you to God. So he's really addressing the, the uh, state of the boys he's speaking to. In other words, find God through me. And now in this one, he's going to talk uh, about the different levels of knowledge uh, from the lowest to the highest. And I wanted to call your attention uh, if I hope I can quickly find it, if my computer is, where are we? Uh, no, it's not there. Um, in uh, the third part of the book, there are six talks to the Mandalay. And uh, let me see. Oh, sorry, I went past it. And uh, one of them, so the, here where you can see where page, uh, yeah, here we are, page 345. This talk is the talk to the Mandali. What is religion? You, the date is the same, 4th December. And here, Nadia did a different version of the same diagram. So this is actually another rendering of the same talk, but it has a lot more material than comes up in the uh, version of the talks the boys we have. I don't know how that happened. It's a very interesting extended story that Baba incorporates. And it so happens for those of you who may know uh, Deshmukh's uh, Sparks from the Dissertations of Meher Baba, if some of you are acquainted with that book, it was published by Sherryar in the early 70s. It was published originally in 1967. That contains a lot of this uh, content. So people might have uh, run across it there. That is this version that appears much later in the book. So that's just to give you some uh, textual history relating to this. But going back to uh, our talk, here is the uh, diagram. Uh, there on the right-hand side, uh, you can see the uh, source diagram. Actually, there are about eight or nine source diagrams. This is one of them that we worked from. And uh, this is the uh, revised version that uh, Nadia uh, created. And um, what this uh, gives is the, these are four Sufi terms. And uh, they're worth getting to know that these terms come up in God Speaks and Tiffin Lectures. These are some of the Sufi terms that Baba used the most. And they refer to the levels of knowledge. So down at the bottom there, Shariat, if you, I mean, it's in the news a lot. A lot of Americans would have heard of the Shariat, um, Sharia law. That's this. And uh, but Baba uses it not with respect to Islam only, but with reference to that level of all of the religions, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism. It's the level of uh, doctrine, dogma, 
rites, rituals, ceremonies. It's a ceremonial worship. So most of the religions of the world are in fact uh, acting on the level of the shariat. Um, and so uh, we put in symbols of the great world religions. And part of the point of this diagram, as Baba will be explaining, is that the religions are separate at the level of the shariat. But when you enter into the spiritual path, they're not different anymore. So that's the tariqat. You may have, you, these are Sufi terms. If it, people have been involved in Sufism, they're the tariqats. And Baba associates that with seeing. Shariat Baba associates, he's linking these levels with levels of knowledge, would be intellectual understanding, the kind of understanding that people like me have got. But in Tarikat, on the spiritual path, and this probably refers to the lower uh, uh, planes, maybe the first three, four planes of the spiritual path, there you have sight of inner realities. And the level higher than that is marifat, marifat, gnosis. Um, and there, like fifth and sixth planes, there you have real knowledge of inner realities. In the fifth plane, you have knowledge, direct experience of thoughts. In sixth plane, you have direct experience of feelings. And the highest level is real realization. And that is, the Sufi term is hakikat. Hakikat. Um, hak means the truth. Hakikat is the state of the truth. So uh, hakikat would be God realization. So those four terms again are shariat, tarikat, marifat, and hakikat. These are, as I say, terms which Baba used a lot. And uh, uh, okay, maybe to start the. Is it maybe somebody could read this key? Do we should have the reading start with that? Yeah, um, Diana Goodhart, would you be our first reader today? Okay, this is the key to figure three. The four levels in the pursuit of truth, which comprise the subject of the opening part of this lecture, are represented in figure three as a B, C, and D, with an associated wording Meher Baba took from the lexicon of Sufism. Yeah, so here that is, right? So you remember that, A, B, C, and D, and those four Sufi terms. The spiritual pilgrim begins at the bottom, at the level of A, or Shariat, that is, the husk of religion, and from there ascends through B, Tarikat, or the initiary stages of the spiritual path, on to the higher planes of Marifat, C, or the mystic esoteric knowledge of saints. The journey reaches its goal in D, Hakikat, or truth, which is to say, God realization. At the level of Shariat, the bottom rung on this ladder, the understandings and dogmas and rituals of different religions are distinct from each other, as is represented in this diagram by the symbols of different major world religions. So here those are, right? So they're all separate at that level. Hmm. Thereafter, the path becomes one and differences between the religions come to an end. Figure 41 on page 344 is another rendering of the same diagrammatic idea. Okay, that's what I showed you a little bit earlier. Okay, so now here the lecture starts. This figure was right at the beginning of the lecture. Still me? Yes. Hmm. In figure three, the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, etc. signify the various religions of the world. Now, 
Who gave these religions to humanity? The prophets did, which is to say, the Sadgurus, who, after attaining to realization, came back down to the world for the discharge of their duties. Okay, do you want to read this note here? Can you In see it? Okay. Hmm. In these early years of his advent, Meher Baba did not often use the word avatar as a designation for the periodic incarnation of God in human form. Thus, Baba here attributes the foundation of the great world religions to Sadgurus, a term which, as time passed, Baba came to use synonymously with perfect master, when in fact, Muhammad and Christ and Buddha, whom he names below, were more than this. The distinction between perfect master and avatar had not yet been explained by Baba in these early years. Later in this series of talks, however, Baba gave the boys hints of his own avataric status using that word, avatar. Yeah, that's a remarkable thing about these talks, actually. Hmm. Okay, where am I? Okay. Um, and what is the aim of their having descended thus leaving the eternal bliss of their realized state? Their one and only purpose is to make others realized just as they themselves are, and towards the achievement of that object alone do they direct all of their workings, internal as well as external. To some, namely, to members of their inner circle, they impart realization in that very same lifetime in which they themselves are alive. There's a note here, yeah. Elsewhere, Meher Baba has clarified that members of the Sadhguru circle usually achieve, achieve realization several lifetimes after having been taken into the circle. Do you want me to read that other little part? Yeah, maybe. Okay. See Baba's yeah. comments in his 26 November 1927 lecture, pages 338 through 39. Okay, that's probably enough for that. But the thing to note is that this very matter is discussed <laughs> um, not in the talks to the boys, but in one of the talks to the uh, Mandali that are later in this book. Hmm. As to the those others closer in their connection than the general public and the people of the world, that is, those who may be called bhaktas and who have secured their place in the outer circle, these persons advance spiritually more than ordinary people do. To the world in general, these prophets and sadgurus give a general spiritual push, which they bring to effect by laying down certain rules and regulations, which help the general populace to proceed as easily as possible towards the path and to enter into the stage of tarikat. These rules and regulations established by such spiritual masters or sadgurus are known as the tenets of a religion to which people attach the name of the religion's founder, as, for example, the Zoroastrian religion named after the prophet known as Zoroaster, or the Christian religion named after Christ, the Mohammedan religion after Muhammad, and so forth. Yeah, back in those days, they would often call it Mohammedism. More recently, Muslims have come to object to that, saying it's religion of Allah, not Muhammad. But in the early 20th century, Muhammadism was a common term. This path or marg is called the Shariat marg, and it is meant for the masses and millions of the world. It represents the first step towards advancement in the spiritual line. Let's see what that note, yeah. The word Shariat or Sharia, 
is specifically Islamic, yet Meher Baba used it as a designation for the exos exoteric aspect of religion in general. The phrase Shariat Marg yokes together Muslim and Hindu terms in a way that neither Muslims nor Hindus would typically have done. You get that, right? In other words, this is kind of a, a language that no one would use in India, bringing a very Islamic term and a very Hindu term, Shariat Marg. But Baba would do that all the time. Now, why have all the Sadgurus and prophets given different religions? Why do they lay down different rules and regulations if their common aim was only to direct the minds of the people towards God? Why different rules for the solution of one common problem? Let us discuss this. And uh, I, I hope you don't mind if I'm jumping in from time to time, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, having read this so much, uh, this is addressing the matter of why the religions are different from each other. Mm -hmm. If there's one reality and one God, why are there different doctrines, doctrines and different dogmas and teachings? Why are the religions, why do they contradict each other? This is one of the most interesting uh, uh, explanations that Baba gave on that. And notice that he's talking to a to boys, some of them are Zoroastrian, some are Hindu, and some are uh, Muslim. And I think there is even a Christian kid there. Suppose that Sri, a Sadguru, descends to the world plane to turn from worldliness those who have little or perhaps no connection with him from the past, such as members of his circle do. Now, Setting aside the matter of his own circle members, who as a matter of course he will make God realized as he himself is, how is he to turn the faces of the masses and millions of the world in the direction of God and the spiritual path? And exactly when will he do this? Well, thank you, dear uh, Diana. That was very good. And uh, our next reader will be Marvin. You ready, Marvin? To bring this to accomplishment, <clears throat> Sri will begin by marking the certain points and factors in the environment, namely the time, place, mentality of the people, their inclinations and bent of mind, and so forth. And after making careful note of these conditions, he will think of some easiest and best way, and will decide upon a particular doctrine, some keynote with which to guide the people, and he will proceed to preach the same. In short, this preaching of a doctrine of a... Here you go. To the line and put on the path in no time. Indeed, not only can the Sad Guru get you initiated in the path, but he can give you realization itself in the twinkling of an eye. Such tremendous powers he has, but he will use them only when he thinks it proper and only after testing the candidate through a course of arduous hard trials. In other words, not only can he lead you to the point of admission, but he can easily advance you through the various stages which he himself has seen, known, realized, and crossed. <clears throat> it is for this reason that the Nightingale of Shiraz sings such glorious tributes to the Murshid who can do such wondrous things. Do we have a Persian speaker in attendance? Okay, well, I'll just, see, yeah, I don't I'll, see I'll, either. I'll just read, uh, I'll butcher it. Hafiz Toboro Bandigi e Pire Mugan Kun Bar Daman 
Vardaman e udast zan o az hame bexal. And the literal translation, you want to read that. This is, that we'll give literal translations in the notes. Hafez, go and make yourself a slave to the Pier Imogan. Touch your hand to his daman and sever yourself off from everything else. The Persian text for this couplet is from Kodi's etc. Ivan e Hafez, yeah. That apparently is the addition that they had in Baba's ashram. Kodzi. And I suppose this is another way to say it. Oh, Hafez, Hafez, go and worship your master. Get a hold of his skirt with your hand. Sever all your connections. Give up everything. Ultimately, the same is true even for those who have no guru and who proceed on the path alone without one. They may succeed in turning their faces to God after ages and ages. When their turn and opportunity comes, they may advance and advancing find themselves enabled actually to see God himself. This is the most they can achieve on their own, but they cannot realize for that, the grace of the realized guru is essential. Quite different is the case of those who travel with a guru. He can give them realization however and whenever he likes, by stages gradually or all at once in a moment as it pleases him. Thus, it can be seen that the Shariat Marg is too long and difficult, affording a rare chance to only one out of millions. And that too, only if all the demands of the shariat are most minutely and strictly observed. So what to do? How to move towards God at the earliest opportunity? The best and easiest way is the religion of Hakikat, the religion of love or prem, that is the sublime, unbounded love for God. This means love for the guru, who after making a strict examination of the candidate or disciple, reveals this best and easiest way to him. But that test usually proves to be more than most of these candidates can successfully undergo. Here was related the recent incident concerning a telegram for Sheriyar Mrubanpur. Mrubanpur. Now you may recall that on December 2nd, when Baba's series of talks to the boys began, that very same day, five um, young men disciples, you know, in the 20s, 30s, actual Mandalay, um, went into seclusion in these small, very small little cabins, I mean, tiny, like little closets that uh, had been constructed immediately adjoining the uh, uh, crypt cabin. You know, the crypt cabin is now Baba's Samadhi. Uh, they were not where the graves of Mera and uh, of Mani and the women are on the right hand side, but they're behind the Samadhi. And uh, so they went into seclusion and they were living just on milk and keeping silence. And they were to stay inside their little cabins. And uh, Sheriyar Mirabanpur was one of these. And uh, over the next two months, a whole bunch of them really had overpowering spiritual experiences. <laughs> at the very same time that the boys were going through their own version of this. So Sherry Amarabanpur was one of them. He had just arrived from Iran. He came with this uh, a uh, Baidul in July of 1927. So this is like December 1927. In July, brought uh, four, 14 um, boys from Yazd in Iran. One of them 
I mentioned Asfandir Vasali because people knew him, but also there's this Abdullah Pakravan and others. And Sheriyar Maribanpur came with them. So he had just gone into seclusion in the cabin and a telegram came for him. That's what Baba's talking about. While he was still here outside, not yet having entered his room, nothing happened. But the moment he was inside his seclusion cell, a telegram came for him. And I'll okay. read it. Yeah, read, read the note. Yeah. The text makes reference here to one of the five men. The others were Gopal Swami, Shankarnath, Manakar, and Gulabsha, whom Baba had selected to seclude themselves each in his own cell in a structure called the Sadak Ashram, located immediately adjacent to the crib cabin. During the proposed seclusion, they were supposed to meditate, fasting on milk and water without leaving their respective cells for any reason. They stepped into their rooms and commenced their seclusion on 2nd December, which also happened to be the date of the first of the lectures in this book. In Sherryar's case, the moment he had made his way into his room, a telegram came for him. Since he was a new resident of Meribad, having traveled from Iran with Baidul and the group of Meher Ashram boys the previous July, the arrival of a telegram would have been an important event sorely tempting him to leave his cell and break Baba's seclusion order. Our sources do not tell us how he responded, but since his seclusion continued, along with that of the other four men, presumably he passed the test. So do you, got, you guys get the, what, the point here? I mean, nowadays a telegram is like no big deal or like an email message. But in those days, it was quite a big deal, especially for someone like him who had just come from Iran. It might be from his father, his mother might have died. It might have been crisis, come home. And in other words, it would be a big deal. And having just gone into seclusion, it would be quite a big test for him whether he would come out of the cell and uh, get the telegram. I'm sure that's the point that Baba was making here. Turning once again to the boys, Sri remarked that their testing even then was underway and in progress, side by side with these daily explanations. The time is approaching, he said. The time is near, so beware and prepare yourself for the prize the prize of seeing and knowing God. Okay. We have one more paragraph in this talk. Who knows, tomorrow or any day now, Sri may lock himself up in seclusion. And who then will explain all these matters to you? So act according to the instructions that Sri has given. Create Prem, create love, by constant meditation, and after the four daily routine works are concluded, after the four daily routine works are concluded, Sri may reveal the path to five or 50, or even half the world, as it pleases him to do. All depends on one's preparation and deserving. Okay, that's the end of the first of, that's the end of that lecture. Yeah. Shall we see if there are any questions about that? Uh, yeah. You can raise your yeah. hands. I, I posted earlier, if anybody has a question, go ahead and raise your not hand. If not, we'll go on to the next lecture. Hmm. Jim Wilson. Well, I just want to make a comment that sure. I, find it, I find it interesting how Baba says how important the Shariar is. Uh, for most people, it is the, the kind of entrance into any kind of advancement on the path. And mm. there's such a tendency to uh, short shrift any of the religions and basically smear them. Mm. And Baba himself said that many of them have disintegrated into uh, what was far beyond or, or far under what the, what the prophet was saying. 
but it is important to know that you know those uh, people who are going to church every Sunday and things like that, mm -hmm. that we have to respect that. And they were, yeah, these uh, shariats were given uh, by the sadgurus or avatars. Yeah. And they were actually laid down according. That's such a neat passage for Baba. It's like Baba's explaining to these boys about how he takes note of uh, the sadguru after returning to creation consciousness, takes note of the tendency of the people of the time and observes them. And having done so, then he selects a keynote or a key doctrine. And that, I mean, like Buddha, there's the wheel of the law and the four noble truths. You know, Muhammad, there's there's no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet. You can see different keynotes. So here he's explaining how that happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Chris, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, uh, just a question. Uh, word, was there a page that started with the word doctrine? It seemed like he, uh, Baba was talking about... Um, uh, how the world religions form, and then there was kind of an abrupt change in, in the topic. In this, uh, yeah, this page here, doctrine at a particular time, is that what you're referring to? Yes. Did we read that page? I hope we did. In short, this preaching of a particular... Yeah, I think we read that, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, doctrine at a particular time. Yeah, that's the very thing passage we were just referring to. Before a particular mass of people requires beforehand. Now, this is the Sadhguru. So it's sort of like Baba is coming back into creation consciousness. A close study and observation of the time, place, circumstances mentality of the masses, and so forth, as we have said. Every prophet has done this, and each has highlighted. Did we read this? We I, read I think this. Chris was right. I think we missed that, too, because I was reading, and it, did, it seemed like a disjointed connection from one page to the other. Oh, I guess we jumped over this page. Well, let's read it now. Oh, my goodness. How did we? Okay. Okay, do we want to have someone read this? Doctrine at a particular time. Yes. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Elizabeth. <laughs> okay. Oh. Every prophet has done this, and each has highlighted his own particular doctrine as he deemed best in view of the time, people, and circumstances. Muhammad, a realized Sadhguru, when he came down to the earth plane, decreed certain rules and regulations for the people to follow as he judged best, such as would lead them to the path of truth. So did Buddha in his time, and so did they all. That path laid down and prescribed by each prophet for the general masses in his time is called the Shariat Marg. It constitutes the first step by which one proceeds towards the Tarikat and thence onwards toward towards realization. It must be noted that those immersed in the Shariat Marg, which is to say the general masses of humanity, are only playing with the outer cover of religion, the real end and aim of which is to realize God. For in their higher object, all religions teach the same thing, and indicate rules that lead generally um, lead the generality of mankind towards the one ultimate aim, the realizing of self through their ways, though their ways and doctrines differ in accordance with the different times and conditions in which they are preached. We need to mark and underscore at this juncture that this Shariat Marg preached by the prophets for the benefit of the masses, if followed promptly and wholeheartedly adhered to, leads on to the point B in figure three, which signifies the entrance and the beginning of the real path through the plains, which one experiences at the stage of 
tarikat, where one turns one's face towards God and one's back to the world. So just Even, to flash, flash back to the figure, you see tarikat there, he's talking there, that B level. What he's referring to once you get beyond the shariat. Sorry, here, let me take a second. Okay. The uh, figure three, which signifies the entrance and the beginning of the real path through the plains, which one experiences at the stage of Terricot when one turns one's face towards God and one's back to the world. Even this is just the mere beginning, but it is the real beginning. Until this crucial turning, all experiences in the world was like grappling and grasping at the shadow. For, and for this reason, the near impossibility of progress under such conditions only one out of millions, 20 millions roughly stated, reaches this point unaided after following strictly the injunctions of the Shariat Marg. Now we come to the next stage, which pertains to those connected with a, mur a Murshid or Sadguru, or more particularly, those of the outer circle, the Bhaktas, of a master. What is their religion? One thing and only one thing, to obey the order of the master. Hafez explains this beautifully. Beme sage de Ramjin kon garat piri mugan gurat guyad ke salek bakhbar na bovadze ra. So the well, literal translation is down below. Hmm. Uh, this couplet translates, color your prayer rug with wine if the Pir i Mugan tells you to. Since the Salik is not unacquainted with ways and customs of the stations. Uh, Marseille. Manziel, Manziel, as Manziel, in Manziel. Yeah, it's hard to read. Mm. Manziel. Yeah. Okay. Um, Pir e Mogan, literally the pier or advanced site from the town of Mogan, is a phrase Hafiz often used for what Baba des designated as the master or here Mershid. Manziel means house. It became a technical term in Sufi spiritual parlance or stations of the path. The quotation above is from the third couplet of the first guzzle in Muhammad e Kodzi's edition of the guzzles of Hafiz, Divan e Hafiz, Tehran Nasher Chesma, 2003, page 68. Though Kodzi's, Kodzi's edition has been superseded in Islamic scholarship, it has been preferred in this edition as a source probably used in Mayor Baba's early ashrams. This couplet can also be found in the edition of Parviz Natel Kanlari, Divine Ihafiz. Yeah, and so forth. Yeah. So this is explaining the reason that we've used Kodzi. Um, one of the uh, Prem Ashram kids, as an old man, has apparently had indicated that that was the book they had. Um, so that's the addition we use. By the way, the reason um, when right after a couplet of Hafez, the book will usually give a translation, but it's kind of, it looks like it's Baba's translation with explication. He's kind of freely explaining it a bit. So we put in the uh, footnotes a very limited literal translation of the um, couplet. But here Baba goes on with the uh, to translate it himself. So, Ward, you're saying the 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 uh, part within the text is Baba's translation. Yeah, okay. yeah. But I mean, sometimes he's kind of free with it. He'll explain it, or he'll amplify, or sometimes he'll be literal. You know, because when he would have had this read out, 
um, uh, some of the those in attendance would have known it, the Persian boys would. So then he would be explaining what it means. So we're giving at the in the footnote a very literal translation, but this is Baba's kind of glossing and explication. So, quote, color your prayer cloth with wine if your murshid tells you to do so, because he is not ignorant. He knows fully well about the winds and wares, whereas wares of the path, end quote. Mm -hmm. Or to explain and bring out the implications of this couplet more fully, if your guru asks you to go in a way that is contrary even to the dictates of your own religion, obey his orders. For why was religion given in the first place? To enable you to arrive at point B in the diagram, and from there to gain entry into the real path, which is possible for you if you follow strictly all the tenets that your religion lays down. But if, on the other hand, you have the good fortune to come into the orbit of a Sadhguru, immediately you will be brought. Yeah. into the line and put on the path in no time. Indeed, not only can the Sadhguru get you initiated in the path, but he can give you realization itself in the twinkling of an eye. Such tremendous powers he has, but he will use them only when he thinks it proper and only after testing the candidate through a course of arduous, hard trials. In other words, not only can he lead you to the point of admission, but he can easily advance you through various stages, which he himself has seen, known, realized, and crossed. It is for this reason that the Nightingale of Shiraz sings such glorious tributes to the merchant who can do such wondrous things. So bet, we've read all, we read all this. Uh earlier do you want to read it again or that's we probably got it right yeah yeah that was the place where we must have missed the whole two pages. chris thanks for yeah, noticing thanks for that, we that. Paid. it was a critical <laughs> two pages yeah so in the version of this that you'll find later in this book there's a very very long four or five page story uh, that baba gives to illustrate this point about a boy who is traveling. Anyway, it's a wonderful story illustrating the difference between the shariat and the uh, guidance of a master. And apparently it's the same talk. It got left out of this version, but put into that version. So there are any questions about what we just read or anything else in this particular talk? Go ahead and raise your hands if you do. And we have... Cliff Ives, Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if Baba addresses the fact that the, the, the Sharia, the knowledge, the rules and regulations that the prophet gives, does he, does he talk about the corruption of these things? Because it seems to me there's so much of uh, the prophet's word that has been corrupted in the, the Sharia of religions. Yeah, he seems to. I'm guessing that he just doesn't want to badmouth religions and and. Um, you know, in that. the Tiffin lectures, which Baba had given the year before, Baba does talk about that how they've been corrupted and uh, spoilt, and uh, he's very sharply critical of the religions. My guess is that with these kids. Um, he just gave them a little bit and didn't want them to think about that because he was going to whisk them right up into the uh, upper spheres very quickly. So I, I think that we, this wasn't the audience he wanted to be thinking about that. Well, you know, the That's other thing, guess. Lord, I think is that uh, there was a lot of uh, infighting among the different religions in mm. Baba's ashram at that time, the, there was a lot mm. of conflict arising, plus in the village, right? Yeah. So he was being sort of careful with the boys about how he talked about this, um, because it would get back to their right. parents and then come and pull them out. 
Yeah, and he probably didn't want them to start uh, brooding on religious differences among them. I mean, he had Muslims there, Hindus, Zoroastrians, Christian. I mean, <laughs> I always marvel at the apparent harmony of all these different groups within this Mayor Ashram. You never hear one word about uh, religious conflict. So I think Baba was very carefully keeping those problems from coming up. Seems like. Mm. Cheryl, did you have your hand up? Or? Yeah, I just have a comment. I've heard Mayor Nuz pronounce it Pire Mohan many, many times. So the G is not pronounced in the in Pire Mohan. Mohan, huh? How the, how the uh, Iranis, the Zoroastrians um, from Iran pronounce it. Yeah, yeah. Pire That's Mohan. the name. Uh, apparently, Baba said that um, Hafiz's master uh, had told Hafiz not to name him directly in his poetry so hafez never does but he'll use that term the piri mohan maybe it said ha or something i don't know maybe some consonant um yeah elizabeth did you have a question i thought you had oh well, I, I was just a comment that really yeah you, you know uh, a lot of times baba will tell people to do things and you think it's just crazy and uh, I mean, this is the explanation for why it's, it's, it's just a way to get people to move further along the path, you know, and, and the, the critical nature of obedience. And, um, mm. you know, it, it's so easy to question. And there's so many stories about people who come to Baba and they question him. I mean, even people who are spiritually advanced and, and they can't take the guidance and Baba will have to ask them to leave or they end up going away. And then the, the upshot of the story is um, something bad happens to them or they lose contact with Baba or they don't progress. You know, that's the end of the story. And uh, this is a very interesting explanation, I thought, of um, when a master tells you to do something, even though it's against what you would normally have in your own chariot or whatever, like telling mm. Hindus to eat beef. I mean, you know, he would do things like that. Yeah. And it just, to, it, to the rational mind, it sounds nuts. But <laughs> when yeah. you understand the spiritual explanation, it makes more sense. That's my own. You know, um, yeah. when you get the book, um, if you go to the other version of this that Baba gave to the Mandalay, Baba has a three, four, five page story on exactly this. It shows it beautifully, you know, how uh, the, the character uh, representing the Sadhguru, and Baba explains this, tells this young man, this kid, uh, has him do all sorts of things that directly contradict what he was told by his father. And his father represents the Shariat. And, uh, the point is that when you have a mat, when you uh, don't have a master, it's best to follow the shariat. But when you have a master, uh, you follow the master, even if the, the rules of the shariat are directly uh, contradicted. Fantastic story on that exact point. Okay, mm. Jack, Jay Baba. Yeah, re re I'm mute. Referring back to what uh, Ward was talking about uh, five minutes ago on, on the Baba's attempt to be discreet in regards to religions, I think the, the story of Ali and Sabs and Thrabs brings, brings that whole thing out pretty much uh, where, where the, his father constantly, you know, came to the ashram and pulled him out and Ali escaped the house that he was locked up in and came back to the to the uh, to the ashram. Well, I just wanted and that to happened. Ali was the most spectacular case, but that happened with a bunch of the other boys too. So yeah. there really was religious conflict outside 
the mayor ashram coming from the parents. That was a big theme. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. Welcome. Mm. Chris. I just want to say that that uh, chart is wonderful. I love that, how it shows the mm. different religions and then they all merge together uh, mm. as one gets to the to the spiritual path up there. I've never seen a, a better uh, graphic just illustration of how they uh, all come together in the in the higher realm. Great chart. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm? Well, well, if I can make a comment, Ward, you said that there was a lot of harmony in the ashram, but from things I've read, like even in the Tiffin lectures uh, and from Dr. Ghani's writings and some other places, it it sounds like there were quite a few episodes where they got into heated hmm. discussions with each other. No, I, I meant uh, within the mayor ashram, oh, not the within the Maribad ashram. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Because Baba yeah, was right. really creating a very special atmosphere for these mm -hmm. kids mm -hmm. that was different from that among the Mandali. The Mandali weren't even allowed to touch them, you know, yeah. or to say anything. So he was really doing special work with them that was distinct from every other group that he was working with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was plenty of conflict. Among the Mandali, of course, they all knew that you know that god is beyond the differences of religion but those differences came up anyway <laughs> yeah. diana yes um or you may have mentioned this before but um who created the first charts that we see for example on the right because this beautiful yeah. rendition on the left was taken from the one on the right and, and there will be many right. Do we yeah know them? I don't. I don't. I wish we did. I mean, we have uh, a lot of these are in the source manuscripts. So some of them will be in the very source man uh, source manuscript for this book. Uh, we're calling it Shri's Explanations on Creation and the Universe. Um, but there's a, a, there are a lot of gaps, a lot of places where a diagram is meant to be. There is just a gap. So very often I had to really search widely for many other places and found a lot of them in other places. But how Baba did it, I don't, it's, it's never explained anywhere. I presume, um, my, I mean, I would say almost certainly uh, for some of the diagrams we're going to see later, uh, Baba had... Um, various among the Mandali, I think Adi was pretty good at this, and there may have been others, draw a version of the diagram on a board, and it probably was on display sometimes for several lectures in a row, and the boys could have looked at it, because Baba is clearly referring to diagrams sometimes. So he must have had someone among the Mandali draw them. Um, I imagine Baba wouldn't have drawn it himself because he was not writing at this time, but he could have, you know, told them what to do. Hmm. I wish we knew. I wish we knew things like this. You know, uh, you, many of you may not know this, but uh, Ward was uh, for 25 years uh, imprisoned in the rice go down in Maribai, <laughs> all by himself. All he had was a little hovel in the corner with an old blanket. I think he had a lantern <laughs> and a couple <laughs> nubs of a pencil putting all this together. So we're very grateful for all those years. Now you're out of your hovel. We can, uh, we can yeah. enjoy it. I will say this. You know, you're seeing the recreated diagrams, but the, yeah, a massive, massive amount of work went into this. Mm -hmm. um, just... I mean, already all the sources had been assembled, but Nadia and I spent a whole year and three months meeting three, four days a week, um, going over all the sources. And there might be mistakes anyway. By the way, part of the point of having a key is so that people can see for themselves what at least one of the sources was like. Uh, many times there are many sources, so we would select just one for the key. But on the Trust website, uh, all of the sources are going to be up online. Yeah. 
So these diagrams, uh, there's an interpretive dimension that has gone into it, you know. Um, so you can be skeptical of that if you okay. wish. Elizabeth, do you have another question or comment? Unmute. You're muted yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. I, I find it very comforting that Baba also said that you don't have to leave your religion. And I think there are other places where it's said that he came to revitalize all the religions. Mm -hmm. And just like Elizabeth Pattern said, that she doesn't go to church to, for church sake. She she takes Baba to church. And I feel very much that way when I go to church. I was raised in a very strong Presbyterian background, church every Sunday and all of that. And then I went away from it. And then, but I I do think the the discourses in particular revitalized a lot of the teachings in the Christian tradition. And and um though these may not have been corrected by the sad gurus, I mean, the religions, uh, previous religions, uh, perhaps when the avatar comes, they are all revitalized in the way in which they were originally intended. And um, the focus on the unity of the basic values um, is reestablished. Hmm. Good point. Yeah, you know, Baba, you know, these symbols, Baba worked a lot with the religions and with these very symbols, like right on his tomb, you have the symbols of religions. Um, and I'm sure most of you are acquainted with the, that period in the new life, where he had these models, uh, alabaster models created in Mananash, and Baba would sit and do some kind of work with them for hours together. So it was a major part of his work, apparently. And of course, there's Amartiti, which I think is mm -hmm. the most wonderful celebration. Mm -hmm. It's my favorite, where all the religions and, uh, and the cults of the worlds are brought together like beads on a string. I, mm. that, that is kind of what brings me to Baba, actually, that concept. Mm. Uh, and Amartiti is a celebration of this very thing. Thank you. It's interesting because Baba brings up this subject so prominently in this second lecture. And then that's it, man. That's all he has to say about it. He really had a special work with these kids. He was um, giving them a little of a framework, but he was going to take them right into the inner realities. Thanks. Jim Wilson. Uh, Ward, uh, were you naked in the go down? <laughs> because what I'm thinking, there's a reference earlier about uh, the ones on the path were naked, and then I noticed that Baba referred to the chariot as the clothing um, <laughs> that you're in, you're, you're in. So do you think that that's what he means uh, when he's talking about them being naked, that they are now separate from the chariot? Might be, yeah, yeah. Is my microphone making a lot of noise? By the way, yeah, it sounds like there's a looseness to it, but uh, it's not yeah, too. I, I don't know what the problem is. Let me try. Huh. It's kind of breaking up a little bit. Can you hear me anyway? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Good. Yeah. You're fine. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what the deal is. I'll have to ask Naman next time I see him. It's, yeah, let him do a check on uh, it. Any other questions? Mm. Um, we, you know, we can we can go on to the next one, uh, and it gets juicier and juicier. <laughs> Elizabeth, what did? You, oh, you want us to? You want to go on? Okay, yeah. All right. Why don't we go on then, Ward? You ready? Okay. So our first reader now is, let's see, Jim. Okay. Now this is where it really begins. And uh, I'll just give a little explanation that gets repeated in this. By the way, when you see um, this uh, 
this treatment here on the right hand side, page 111, where it's kind of screened back and that little dotted line at the bottom editor. This means it's not Baba's voice. This is from the editor. And there was a need for that. And what happened was that um, the primary source for creationist causes was the typed manuscript uh, that um, uh, it, the rice go down came in a top sheet copy and then a carbon copy. Uh, the carbon copy is oftentimes more valuable because many times the diagrams would be filled in there, but not the top sheet. And it turned out that uh, the Pearsons had a third uh, copy of it. This diagram we saw of Baba and the eye in the universe, that's from the uh, manuscript that they had. Um, but in all three manuscripts, the first page of this lecture is missing. Everyone starts on page two, it's numbered page two. But uh, there are two other important manuscripts that, uh, there are a bunch of them, but two especially important that I used a lot that looked like they were directly, uh, all of these um, uh, talks apparently were recorded by Chanji and uh, the typed manuscript we have is apparently based on that. And Chanji's original manuscript is lost. But it looks like Ramju, one of Ramju's write-ups, drew directly on Chanji's original manuscript. And it uh, tracks very closely to uh, the typed manuscripts. Uh, so we have the version in Ramju's manuscript. So I used that for these pages and it's probably very reliable and very good and thank god we have it because this is actually significant uh stuff in this very first page so and you know where the west tank room is right this uh that's right now uh for those of you who remember upper maribyte it's the museum room you know the museum room it's the uh room on that big building in mayor retreat facing the samadhi so baba at this time had not yet gone into seclusion in the crypt cabin but would come to that room to give his talks in about two weeks he moved to the uh, crypt cabin and spoke from there elizabeth did you have a question before we start the next one? well i just uh, uh i just want to ask ward uh does anyone have any idea what happened to chanji's manuscript i mean was it burned up or something or they just no can't idea. find it i mean we've inferred its, its existence through various indications um in the back of the book um in the uh, supplement there's a very full and detailed discussion of all the sources and all that we know about them for anyone interested in that when the book comes out. I know most people are not gonna read that kind of thing, but some people will. Some, and it's important to give this information to authenticate this edition. All right, Jim. Okay. In all three primary source manuscripts for Meher Baba's explanations to the Meher Ashram boys, the first page of this talk is missing. The text in these sources begins on page two, and the date is given as 5th or 6th December 1927. However, strong textual evidence suggests that the substantial content of the missing page one, though written up in a different form, appears in the opening pages of one of the principal analog manuscripts, Ramju's explanations in pencil. Much of the content of this portion of Ramju's explanations in pencil is foundational uh, conceptually for what follows, both in the succeeding sections of Ramju's explanations in pencil and in the series of lectures in explanations, starting from this, the talk of 5th or 6th December. Accordingly, the relevant extract from Ramju's explanations in pencil pages one to three, is, rep is presented here, including two diagrams. Note from the editors. 
So that's the source and what follows. Okay. And uh, let's see. Maybe we could come to the diagram uh, when the discussion gets there, which will happen soon. Okay. Extract from Amju's Explanations in Pencil, pages one to three. First of all, let us remember that God is neither ocean, nor wave, nor drop, neither light, nor light globe, nor light point, neither knowledge, nor knowing. If not these, how much less can he be taken to be their opposites, hollowness, and shadow, and ignorance? To put it in a nutshell, the Almighty stands altogether beyond imagination and intellect and always is and remains one indivisible whole. This I, must be I hope you won't mind if I jump in from time to time. Yeah, go just, right uh, ahead. This is really an important paragraph. Notice these three systems, um, mm. light, light globe, light point, and shadows. That's one. Ocean, wave, drop, bubble, that's another. Knowledge, mm. knowing, ignorance. So these mm. are three systems that he's going to be correlating and developing enormously over the next four lectures or so. Also, mm. he's going, this is going to come up explicitly, but just to sort of adumbrate it, um, the opposites, hollowness, shadow, ignorance. So, uh, like shadow is the opposite of light. Ignorance is the opposite of knowledge. Hollowness in a bubble is the opposite of ocean. So there's going to be a big development on the theme of opposites. It's going to come up. So he's laid, he's given a lot of the menu right here. This must be clearly realized. Otherwise, all delving into this subject is equivalent to groping in and grappling with shadows. For indeed, all this intellectual understanding is nothing at all of no real consideration when, when set against the actual seeing and experiencing of God. Yet to glean some faint idea of this mighty existence through the intellect let us at least understand as far as possible the infinite creator's equally infinite creation. In the endeavor to do this, let us compare what is really and truly the incomparable with ocean, light, and knowledge, since these serve as the most suitable similes under the circumstances. And here's uh, a thing so now. Yeah. Yeah. While the ocean and light can readily be understood as figurative terms for an abstract re referent, since both ocean and light literally designate sensible realities in the phenomenal universe, it is more unusual to think of knowledge this way. Yet Baba refers to all three, ocean, light, and knowledge, as similes. Perhaps he means to convey that what ordinary pink people think of as knowledge is as dissimilar from the reality of God as light and ocean are when they are literally conceived. When Baba says that these provide the most suitable similes under the circumstances, he seems to be referring to the limitations of intellectual understanding under the present circumstances of his communication to ordinary gross conscious persons in attendance, the primary audience, of course, consisting of boys. Okay, so you've got these three are so take note of them. Ocean mm -hmm. light knowledge is going to develop. And here's the uh, figure connected with this. And uh, okay, here's the source, as you can see. But um, A is the ocean of unconscious God. In God speaks terms, uh, this would be the original beyond beyond state of beyond God. Beyond state. Yep. Yeah. And B is the ohm point. We saw in the first of the figures that B is um, creator, preserver, destroyer, Ishwar, the third state of God. And C 
is the same as we saw in that earlier figure. These are all the jivatmas. And Nadia on the, uh, down here on the right did a little blow up. You can see the bubbles, the atma at the center and the bubble encasing it. A drop, you know, the drop as the atma is identical with paramatma in Baba's, you know, metaphysics, the Vedanta metaphysics. Um, and the jivatma is the drop soul in the state of bondage. And D, these are shivatmas. And this is a useful term that Baba used to like to use in these days. That's a God-realized person. It's a very good general designation for a God-realized person of any type. A Majub, a Jivan Mukta, a Sadguru, an avatar, they would all be Shivatmas. Mm -hmm. So this diagram is showing, you might say, the totality of everything. Mm -hmm. Unconscious, God beyond beyond, the creator, preserver, destroyer, all the Jivatmas and the Shivatmas. And uh, though I don't know, perhaps in the future, people will speculate. We copied this egg shape from the source down here. It just, uh, there is, um, in Hinduism, there's the cosmic egg, as a matter of fact, <laughs> Hiranyagarbha. So maybe this is a reference to that in some way. I don't know. Now, somehow this got garbled. I've got to fix this. You're late now. <laughs> it's already gone to the printers. No, no, no. It's not from oh, that. Just it's, on yours. It's, it's, oh. Yeah, it's a different feature and a different element that yeah. uh, there. But uh, I don't know, Jim, can you read this or is this going to be too hard? Uh, to read? Boy, like figure two, figure four represents the oceanic totality of all existent things, which is to say the infinite entirety of God and his creation. Yet the simile... Why? Yet while. Uh, oh, yeah. While B and C, the own point and the universe of, G, of Shivatmas, or drop souls, manifesting as bubbles, carry the same meaning as in figure two, A and D differ. For A represents the ocean of God in its original, unmoving, unconscious state, and D comprises the totality of all Jivatmas. Oh, Shivatmas, which is to say God realized souls or drops who have realized their unity with the ocean. Relations between the Atmas, drops, and bubbles, a major theme in subsequent lectures, is illustrated in the insert on the lower right. That's this down here. Yeah. So the, I'll just flick back quickly to that earlier diagram. Uh, which is related to this one. But mm -hmm. in this diagram, A there on the left, that mm. is actually God, self-conscious God, God aware of himself. B is the creator, preserver, destroyer, and C is all the jivatmas. Um, so this one is different in that the original state on the left, A, is not God self-conscious, but God unconscious and that's going to be the pattern in all the diagrams that follow he's telling the story of the movement from primordial unconsciousness to self-realization ah. okay okay should we go back to everybody get this diagram more or less so am i there? the video was blank you know what i mean so you must have it must have been somewhat uncovered, and the audio is off. Sorry, that was uh, someone unmuted. You're okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Ask a question. Hmm. Yeah. But I, it's about the diagram. That egg. Um, it reminds me of Baba's discussion of the chicken and the egg, the mischievous chicken. Oh. Could it be related to that at all? Well, it was before Baba had given out that figure, but uh, both of them, Mike, I mean, in Hinduism, there is the notion, I'm forgetting the word right at the moment, 
There is a term Hiranya Garbha, but there's another one, and I've forgotten the name, that is the primordial cosmic egg. That's a, an idea in, in Hindu metaphysics. It's sort of hard for this not to look like an egg, isn't it? Yeah. And there it is. That's where we took it from. So it really does bring that to mind to me. So maybe Baba was making a link with that ancient Hindu idea. Yeah. It looks like Karen yeah. Levine has her hand up. Do you want to take a yeah. question? Yeah. Board? Mm. yeah, I got a question about that diagram, the bubble um, and the several looks like eggs inside of it, of the mm. Atma bubble and the, the sea, you know. Um, mm. So are those, is there any explanation about that? Is that like veils? Is that um, the reality that we're projecting out? Is that our family yeah. unit? What, or, you know, what is there explanation? Well, to begin with, this is the actual source. I wish I could blow it up a little bit more. So mm -hmm. a lot of that um, structuring that you'll see here was, uh, come up with by Nadia and me. So, but what we meant to, uh, um, this will be clarified as we move along before too long with Pran or Nakash, which we haven't uh, reached yet. But uh, hollowness is uh, Akash and Pran uh, is movement. Uh, and when they meet, that's when you get the jivatma. So I personally think that the bubble. Anyway, well, well let's get to let's d um, return to that when we really get to pran and akash. But that was our thinking here. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Yeah. All right. I want to keep going, Jim. Oh, okay. Uh, hmm. Let us begin with the figure on the facing page, which we will take as our introduction to this subject. This figure presents God as an infinite ocean with innumerable drops, all of which are themselves nothing but that same very ocean. Now, right, as you so that's all of these drops are actually identical with the totality, right? Mm -hmm. Each drop is the ocean. This is in the first chapter of God Speaks, Bob explains this. This is Advaita Vedanta. Yeah. That's its great theme. Mm. Atma is Paramatma idea. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now, as you can see, figure four shows three subdivisions within the ocean, which nonetheless remains infinite and indivisible. You see the three subdivisions, right? A, C, and D. Right. right. B is just a single point. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have to move pages now. Okay. The portion marked A denotes the ocean still as a mill pond and altogether quiet. This is God unconscious, which knows neither itself as the ocean or the everything, nor does it know the universe, which has the nothing latent within it. This state of God, if given a term or designation, can be called Brahma, or the soul of souls. The portion... See. Yeah, here's the oh, note at the bottom, yeah. Okay, yeah. Brahma serves as the root for several different words in the Indic languages. At different times, Baba used these words with different meanings. It is unlikely that he intends here Brahma, the creator and the creator, preserver, destroyer trinity. His sense seems to be closer to what in Vedanta is called Brahman, which designates the supreme reality. So that's what he seems to be talking about here in A. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The portion Mark C depicts the ocean in motion when separated into innumerable drops which manifest as bubbles. At this stage, every drop, though still one with the ocean itself, is awake, unlike the ocean, soundly sleeping in A. 
Nonetheless, the consciousness of the drops in C is not directed toward the self. Because of the bubbles, the drop, though remaining identical with the ocean, recognizes itself as the drop only. If we assign a term to this state of God, that term should be Jeev, which refers to the individual soul. So that's a term worth, you know, getting to know. Jeev and Jeevatma are really the same. Yeah. Okay. The third portion, labeled D, depicts that same ocean with drops such as Christ, Krishna, Muhammad, Zoroastra, Buddha, Moses, Tukaram, Tajudan Baba, and indeed all Sadgurus. Let's see what that says. Yeah. Okay. Since, as already noted, Baba had not yet differentiated between perfect masters and avatars at this time, all of these great spiritual personalities are here designated as Sadgurus, even though some of them were, in fact, the avatar. Let's see. Here, too, every drop is one with the indivisible whole ocean, but all of these drops in C know that they are the ocean and not the drop at all. In other words, God in this state is conscious of self. If given a term and label, this state of God can be called Shiv or the enlightened soul. Question, what is creation? Answer, manifestation. Maybe someone would like to pick up the reading. Yes, Marion, can you read? Cassandra, yes. can, uh, Elizabeth, can you wait to can you wait till the end? Well, it sounded like a contradiction though between C and D, and I just was confused. Well, we'll talk about that. We want to okay. read more. Okay. Give us about 10, 15 minutes to read and then we'll take questions. Okay. Um this go is, ahead. Is it go begin ahead. with question? It begins with question. Yes. yes. Question, who or what is the creator? Answer, the same ocean, which was still in its original state A, when it began to move to create, and so became the creator at point B, as shown in figure five on page 115. The creator, in other words, is that very point through which the creation manifests. I'll just quickly show you, oh, figure five. Let me see. Yeah, that's the, the creator point right there. Let's see. Yeah, sorry, I'm sort of jumping around here. Okay, and now we have another um, editor's comment. Mm -hmm. At this juncture, we resume with, quotes, explanations, page two of the 5th to 6th December 1927 lecture. Yet we have incorporated in the form of figures six and seven, two further diagrams from Ramju's explanations in pencil, pages five and six, that are missing from the explanations version of this lecture, but that are directly relevant to its content. Paren. In fact, Ramju's explanations in pencil and the explanations manuscripts track with each other fairly closely through this section. Edited. Right, so this is talking about some of the, the most important source manuscript are these explanations manuscripts. There's a, there are carbon copies of one top sheet copy, but these uh, Ramju's handwritten things are important too. So that'll, it's not going to come up very much unless you get into the end notes or the supplement. So now we're back to the principal manuscript. Hmm. Resuming with explanations. Lecture of 5 to 6, 
1227, page two. Proceeding, Shri explained. Now, when this ocean comes into motion from the outset, as depicted in figure six on the facing page, it precipitates in three things, waves, foam, and bubbles. So here's that figure, uh, figure six. So uh, we, be we better take a minute and unpack it all. So here's that original, you see, these figures are actually building on each other. You can see the relationship, right? This is the simple version with A, uh, God, the absolute, and then own point. But now the creation is coming into the picture. By the way, here's the source diagram that we were working from. This is from Ramju's handwritten manuscript again. So we developed it more. So um, here's the own point the creator point. Here are waves and bubbles. So we're going to start to get an explanation of all of that stuff. There's not just bubbles, there's waves also. Mm -hmm. So here's a, Nadia did a blow up of what a wave, a wave bubble. There mm -hmm. are drop bubbles and there are wave bubbles. A wave bubble would be like our planet earth. And a drop bubble would be like you or me, an individual jivatma. So here um, on the bottom center, you see, you know, a drop bubble. It's a drop and a bubble with atma at the center, the whole thing being a drop bubble. Whereas the bottom right is a wave bubble. Notice the wave bubble does not have an atma at its center. Mm. It's, it's not know, a drop mm. I'm wondering if maybe this is a good place to break for today. Mm -hmm. and start okay. with the diagram next time because it does get mm. we've been at it for a while and people's brains are right. starting to drop out <laughs> mine is and let's i think that's a good idea we could just pick up here yeah let's do some Q let me just more. mention the last one though d sure. which is foam and baba says several times i'll explain later what foam is and he never does mm. so foam is a mystery yeah i agree this would be a good time to stop Thank you, all the readers. All right. But you, so can, so you can see that we're really getting into it now, right? Yeah, we are. That's the good part. <laughs> Elizabeth, you had a question earlier? Elizabeth, yeah, you know? it might have been my, uh, it could have been brain fog, but it seemed to me when he was talking about C, I thought he really must have meant D because he was talking about mm. Sadhguru. So I either misunderstood mm. something you mean in, in the earlier diagram diagram? Yeah. Yeah. When I when I made the comment, it was at the mm. previous diagram. I think it was either three or four. Yeah, I think it was yeah. four. Can you go back there? Yeah, right? I think it was four. Yeah. And it talked about the subdivisions. And yeah. um, Ward was explaining, I thought he was explaining D. And in mm. the text it says C instead of D. And that confused mm. me. So I just wanted to get unconfused. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So it says refers to C, but it looked like it should have been referring to D. Uh, so here's the talking about C, the ocean in motion. Yeah, here's the, it starts with this, the portion labeled D depicts blah, blah, blah. And then it says here too, every drop is one with the individual whole ocean but all of these drops in c know that yeah, that, that looks like a mistake maybe that's a maybe that's a mistake could be uh -oh. Uh -oh. i wonder <laughs> if we corrected it or not mm, yeah i think it mm. must mean drops in d know they are the ocean yeah no that's right no that's actually right it should be d <laughs> i hope we picked up on that one Good well, i'll tell you catching Good all one. the mistakes is like impossible <laughs> Yeah. I just thought I was confused, but I'm glad yeah. that. <laughs> no, that. Thank that you for asking. Be, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sometimes there is a reason for my questions. <laughs> yeah. No, it's definitely should be D. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now Thank I'm you. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, Diana. Yes. Um, I wanted to make it just a comment, a connection I made 
um, that, that I enjoyed making. When we say the Master's Prayer, we say, um, you are the soul, um, the soul of souls, the one with infinite attributes. And for the first time I see here where, um, uh, okay, right here, it's at the top of page 114, where Baba tells what the soul of souls is. Mm. He, he, mm. he directly addresses yeah. that. And I appreciate that. That's, That's neat, that phrase, the soul of souls. Yeah, I, I can't think of, I job. wonder where, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, right here, yeah. I've never seen it before in Baba's writing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It'd be nice to do a search for soul of souls, see how often he uses that phrase. Because here it is, the original state of God, which is the source of all. Mm -hmm. Although it's God unconscious, but it's the reality. Hmm. Need, need. Cool. You guys are sharp today. Marion, <laughs> you have a question. <laughs> Unmute, please. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It's personal for me, but it's just what I mm. just read where there was a listing right there, the third portion down further uh, with drops such as Christ, uh, Krishna, Muhammad, mm. Zoroaster, Buddha, Moses, etc., and indeed all sad gurus, because I'm writing a memoir piece for myself personally about when I sat and watched the uh, Ten Commandments movie, mm. you know, here in, I, I lived in St. Louis then, and when it was released, I think it was 57, I'm writing about, because I had a, such an awakening experience in sitting in that film that I didn't understand at the moment because it was so long ago, but in writing about it, when I researched Moses, in in God's in um, in the Lord May here, Baba was saying Moses was on the sixth plane, and that's why it's in the Bible as a metaphor that he couldn't enter into the promised land because mm. he the promised land was the seventh plane. But in the Bible, it's a metaphor, and so I thought, well, did he was he God realized on death, or did he get God realized after that? I do you know anything about that? Because I want to be accurate in my Yeah, mind. I know. I've been uh, puzzled, too, because there do seem to be contradictions. The main place uh, where Baba seems to have said Moses was six plane was his commentary after seeing that movie that you're talking about, uh, where he makes several comments. But in other places, Baba seems to include Moses in the lists of God-realized people. Yeah. Um, so there seem to be some contradictions there. Okay. It's a little bit hard for me to believe that he wasn't God realized. I mean, holy smokes, look at what he did. Yeah. But because I, I thought Baba referred to when it, you know when the burning bush was like the Kundalini or something that, that was opening to the sixth plane, not the seventh. So anyway, it's confusing. I want to yeah, be accurate yeah. in my writing. I I and I've wondered that too. There seem to be contradictory statements as far as I can tell. Okay. But, so I hear yeah, but I, what I've learned uh, in my readings, and I can't tell you where, or whatever, is that there came a time when when uh, Moses uh, had the opportunity to see the promised land, if he wished, mm. or he could achieve God realization if he didn't, and that's when he turned around and ended up in Harvon district. And there is a tomb there and a bust of him that can be seen today. So that's what I got from that. Interesting. You know, in the Quran, I think Moses gets talked about more than anyone else. Huh. Huge emphasis. You see the word Shiv there. That's really a, another word, Shiv or Shivatma, like Jeev or Jivatma. This is kind of a commonplace in Hinduism, Jeev and Shiv, Jivatma, Shivatma. And Baba used that language a lot. So a Shiv is a God-realized person of any type. In this well, series of talks, Baba isn't going to get very much into the different types of God-realized ones, Majubs versus Jivan Muktas versus Sadgurus. Um, maybe he was going to go into that. As I may have mentioned, uh, it's possible that this series of talks got 
uh, cut off before Baba was done because mm -hmm. of what was happening with Abdullah Pakrawan and some of the others. Mm. Well, I wanted to encourage any of the shy ones who have not yet raised their hand and made a comment to go ahead and participate if you'd like. Comments, questions, your insights are always useful um, to somebody. So uh, don't, don't be afraid to make a comment. Mm. Elizabeth. Okay, this is very small. In one of the footnotes, it looked like it said it looked like it's instead of spelling Jivatma, it said G Matma. It had an M before it. And that mm. was uh, an, in a footnote to one of the figures. Mm. So it might have been four, but uh, I I kept trying to read it and it yeah, I kept yeah, seeing. Yeah. I always thought it was Jivatma, not Jeev Matma. Yeah, I know it should be Jivatma. <laughs> But it's, uh, it's but the, this one down here, uh, something happened with the uh, creation of this um, PowerPoint. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure it's not in the uh, original. All this stuff here, it's all jumbled. Yeah. Any further questions on the? There point? it is. It's in the It's in the figure. So the figure, you see, Jeev. Oh, Ma yeah, it is there. Ha, huh, ha, huh, wow. <laughs> My God, you're catching mistakes all over the place. Well, I'm not trying to. I'm just noticing and trying to. Mm. Can you point to it? I don't see where she needs. Yeah, no, right here. Yeah, C. Wow. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. My okay. God, I hope we caught that and took it out. Anyway, if it, we didn't, it's there. <laughs> you know, we proofread this thing so much. You wouldn't believe it. And yet these things slip through. God. Uh, who's doing the publishing of this? Sherry R. Okay. And so we can well, we, can we, we pre-order it? I imagine so. I haven't gone on to their website to see. Yeah, they're not taking pre-orders, but they are keeping a list of people who want to pre-order. Uh -huh. uh -huh. So uh -huh. you can contact Sherry R. Press for that. I think yeah. at this point, it's, it's uh, an opportunity for me to stop the recording. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. And yes. before we do that, I like to say the beloved prayer. So go ahead and unmute and let's say it together. Beloved God, God. God help us help all, us all. Love, you love you more and more and more and more, more, and more. Till till yet more. and more. Till yet more. We become ready of union with you. Help us all to hold fast. Baba Kitab. Baba Kitab. Avatar, may your Baba Kitab. Avatar, may your Baba Kitab. Avatar, may your Baba Kitab. Okay, let me stop the recording and then we can chat a bit here. One second.